Let's, let's get started on today. So here's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about values. Values. And specifically, values in your business. So what I want to go over today is, first of all, the benefit of identifying values for your business. And then I want to spend the bulk of it going over an example of a company's values of one of the most profitable companies in the world. And I think a lot of them can be very reflective on our business here in real estate. So let me start with this. Be honest, be honest. And there's, there's no right or wrong answer here. Have you identified values for your real estate business? Yes, I see people, some people say yes. I see some people say no. I see some people don't have their cameras on, so I assume you're in your pajamas. The world I live in. <laughs> okay. Have you identified values for your business? So let me ask you this then. Is there anyone, and feel free to say if you don't want to, would anyone like to share one of their values that they have written down for their business? There's no right or wrong answer. Does anyone want to share a value that they have? Okay. I will. Go ahead. Getting Katie. back to getting back to people immediately, immediately. If somebody refers someone or calls me, you know, I can step away and just call them and, and answer what they need right away or be there for them. I've gotten so many listings that way and just appreciation from everybody, you know, so. That's huge. Number one complaint that the NAR gets about real estate agents is lack of communication. So being able to communicate immediately, get back to people, great. Who else? Call them before they call you. That's call the customer service. Simple. Call them before they call you. Call them before they call Because by the time you. they've thought about calling you, they've been thinking about you for 24 hours. So they're not exactly happy when they do call you and you don't pick up. If they so call, call them before you, they call been you. been thinking about it for 24 hours. That's a good line. Yeah. Call them before they call you. That's great. Good. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Be ahead of the game. All right. Anyone else? Anyone else want to share one of the values that they have written down for their business? My, I will. Go ahead. Uh, mine is honesty and integrity. Like disclose, disclose, disclose. Disclose, disclose. That there will be a buyer. You don't worry about or be afraid to tell the truth. You do it. You do the right thing. Don't be afraid to tell the truth. Do the right thing. Absolutely. 100%. Disclose, disclose, disclose. They will find out. You can try to hide something from somebody as long as you want. They'll find out about it eventually. Okay. It all comes back to us. Good. Good, 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 good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All good stuff. So I wrote down here in terms of values, okay, a couple reasons on why to define your values. And then we'll get into the example that I was talking about. Okay. So the first thing I wrote down in defining your values, the benefit of defining a value to your business is when you have values written out, you tend to draw people that fit your values as opposed to drawing everybody. So here's what I mean. If you don't define your values, you tend to work with anyone and everyone. It's, it's all over the place, which can be very hectic, can be very draining, can be very emotionally damaging because you're working with a lot of different people. Whereas if you have defined values, you tend to easily be able to block out the people that don't fit your values. Okay? Which is a very, very key thing because you ideally would rather work with people within your values. Right. The second part of defining your values is when you define your values, it helps you in how you would react to certain situations. 
Question, can real estate, as a real estate agent, can the business sometimes get emotional? Yes, no? Somebody answer me. Yes. Yes, it can get emotional. Thank you. Yes. I've got one person listening, <laughs> which is better than yesterday. So we're moving up. All right, so good. It can get emotional. So if you don't have values, you tend to respond emotionally. When you have a design set of values, you tend to respond in the values that you've presented for your business, which could be less emotional, more precise, and more structured. Because if you don't have a def definition of the type of person you want to be, you'll never react to be that person because there's no definition. You're just reacting. But if I set a value of I want to be this person, I'm more likely to react as this person. So it helps you on the de decision making process. It helps you on your response process when you have design set values for yourself and your business, okay? Now, the other thing for your values is it gives you an increase in your confidence. Gives you an increase in your confidence. Well, how the hell does that make any sense, okay? Well, because it brings about some sort of sense of structure some sense of stability. And it also provides you with the values in your own mindset. Because if you can't identify values for your business, then subconsciously you think you don't have value. I'm, I don't have a value for my business, so I'm not providing value. So then what value do I have to clients? And that can really mess with the mind. But when you have values, it's like, okay, I've got values. I have a structure. I have some stability. I provide value. I have values is a different mindset. Gives you that extra confidence. Makes you feel like you're running a real business, not running just a real estate situation that a lot of people do. And the last thing I put down for why the importance of values, of setting aside some values, is if somebody were to ask you what makes you different as a real estate agent, if you don't have a design set of values, that question becomes tougher to answer. But if somebody says, what makes you different as a real estate agent and you have a design set of values for your business, it's much easier to say, boom, 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 boom confidently going back to the previous point. So you have to really just figure out what are your values, okay? Have some defined values for your business. Now, here's the last thing I wrote down before we get into the example that I'm gonna give you. If you don't have values written down for your business, the good news is that makes you a pretty normal real estate agent. But let me ask you this. How many of you want to be normal real estate agents? No, nobody. I do not. No, nobody wants to be a normal real estate agent, right? No. Okay, no, great. Better. Then you need to be. Then you need to have values because when you don't define your values, that makes you a normal real estate agent. Then we all know the production of a normal real estate agent. Don't be normal. Be better. Okay, so now that we know kind of some ideas on why to get values, I want to go over an example here. I, I thought this was just wonderful. So let me ask a question. Who do you think is the most profitable bank in the United States? I don't want to hear my bank sucks or this bank is terrible. I just want to know who you think is the most profitable bank in the United States. JP Morgan Chase. JP Morgan Chase. I'm guessing. Okay. Any other guesses? B of A. B of A. Okay. Anyone else? No. Wells Fargo. B of a. Wells Fargo. Okay. Anyone else want to take a shot? I'm not saying any of you are right or wrong. I just want to see if anyone else would like to take a stab at it. Is it first credit unions? Credit unions. I'm. I. 
Candy, I, I heard you say something, but I didn't hear the answer. I, I, something like First Republic, like a family-owned one. Family-owned, First Republican, okay. Republic. Uh, all right, good, good guesses. So the answer to the most profitable bank in the United States is J.P. Morgan Chase. And they're the most profitable by a pretty wide margin. <clears throat> by a pretty wide margin. They're actually 20% higher in profit than the number two company, which is Bank of America. So Riva Gold Star. Okay. So I found that pretty interesting, okay? Now, again, everyone loves their bank. They hate their bank. That's not the point of this. The point is just from a profit standpoint, J.P. Morgan Chase is the most profitable bank in the United States by a pretty wide margin. So I did a little research into this and I kind of wanted to figure out, well, you know, what is it about this company? Okay, obviously there's, they're big. You know, it was J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America 2, Citigroup 3, Wells Fargo 4, so on and so forth. So they're big. They're everywhere. That helps. Okay. They've bought in some companies, mergers, things like that. But keep in mind, there are some mergers that don't go very well. Uh, so just because they merge doesn't necessarily mean they're profitable, right? So I did a little more digging and things along those lines. And here's what I found really interesting. Amongst the larger banks they seem to have a very, very pointed value system. Now, here's what I mean. When I look up the value system of some of these other banks, it's very elaborate, this paragraph of who we are, and this is what we are, and this and that. And it's all done very, very well. What I found with J.P. Morgan Chase is it's a very bullet pointed, point one, point two, point three. So it's a very defined, very specific, value system that they, the leader, Jamie Dimon, tends not to try to get away from. Now, every bank is going to be different as far as the individual branch level, but their value system. And then I read a little bit more, and there's a number of CEOs across different, different spheres that I was reading about that give JP Morgan Chase, they talk about their value system. So I went into this. I want to share this with you the value system that J.P. Morgan Chase has for their bank. And you'll notice there are a lot of things that we can take from their value system that we can use in our business. So I want to go over these particular points, right? So here's the base. Here's the base. Their base in bold, right? This foundation of their value system is this. We treat customers the way we would want to be treated. We treat customers the way we would want to be treated. That's the bold. That's the base. So point number one to think about. Do we have that mindset of before I respond to a client that's really annoying or really frustrating, am I responding in a way that I'm frustrated or am I responding to them the way that I would want somebody to respond to me? A fair question. How many people know someone who got into real estate because the real estate agent they use stunk? So here's an interesting story. I think she just jumped off. She was on here earlier. So- Was it Melinda? Melinda. Melinda that's how she got into real estate. She bought a house. The agent she worked with was awful. She looked at the closing statement, saw how much money they were making. Now, mind you, she was making about $30,000 a year at that time. Melinda was. She saw how much money that agent made and said, the hell with this. I'm getting into real estate. 17 years later, she's going to make about $1.8 million. Seemed like a pretty good idea. You know how much money? Yeah, you know, I, I tell her all the time. She should go thank that real estate agent. You did such a terrible job. I'm now a millionaire. Okay. Bernie Gallerini from Tennessee. We've had him on here before. If you've ever been to a Mike Ferry event, he got into real estate same way. He was buying a house. The real estate agent he was working with was absolutely terrible. And he said, the hell with this. I'm better than this person. He went and got his real estate license. Now the guy runs a $7 million team in Tennessee. 
So there's a lot of people that become real estate agents simply because we don't treat clients the way we would want to be treated. So you have to make that a very core foundation, which can be hard sometimes. So here's what I wrote down here. Two things. Number one, they're allowed to be stressed. This is all their money. This is it. This is their biggest asset. They are allowed to be stressed and stressed can cause problems, can cause anxiety. They're allowed that. Don't be mad when they're stressed. Okay. Number two, they're allowed to ask questions. Oh, I can't believe they're asking me about this. It's their biggest asset. They're allowed to ask questions. Don't get frustrated. And number three, they don't work in real estate. Don't be mad if they don't understand real estate terms. How do you not know what a loan contingency is? Hey, you still here? I am here. Okay. Imagine you want to learn how to be, you want to learn how to design railroads, right? And they're teaching you and they're using terminology and you get frustrated because you don't understand the railroad terminology. And the railroad person that's teaching you gets frustrated. And you've never designed a railroad your entire life. Most of you probably don't even know railroads still exist. They don't know the terminology but we get frustrated, we get annoyed. Treat them the way that we would want to be treated. So underneath that main value, here's a couple points on how JP Morgan Chase sees that. So here's some value points that they have. Number one, never let profit get in the way of doing what is right for the customer. Never let profit get in the way of doing what is right for the customer. Let's be honest. Well, let me ask you this. Show of hands or put it in the chat box. Have you ever come across a situation where doing the right thing would cost you some money? That ever happened? Jack, it's happened to. Tess, it's happened to. Okay. People in the chat box, you run into a situation where doing the right thing costs you some money. Now, did you do the right thing or did you go get the money? <laughs> yeah. Don't answer. <laughs> Don't answer the question. Yeah, Robert, I've been in that situation. Of course I have. But what'd you do? Well, I took the money. I'm not an idiot. I have bills to pay, dude. <laughs> Never let profit get in the way of doing what's right for the customer. That's going to happen. Sometimes we're going to run into a situation where, look, the right thing might mean less money for me. So here's what I wrote down. Here's what I wrote down. Neil Schwartz 101. You ask a seller who's buying a replacement property, is there any way for you to hang on to this property and still buy the replacement property? Now, some people think, oh my God, why would you ask that question? I might lose the listing. You're letting profit get in the way of what's best for the customer because the reality is in not, all, not every case, because not everyone's meant to be a, a landlord. But in many cases, would it be better if they can hang on to the property and buy a second one for their financial future? Would it be better for them? Hello? Yes. Okay. Amuse me every so often. Okay. So you do what's right for them, okay? They're not comfortable buying a certain house. They have questions. You try to just shove, no, 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 you're fine. Just buy it, just buy it, just buy it, just buy it. You're letting profit get in the way of doing what's right for the customer. Never let profit get in the way of doing what's right to the customer. I wrote down here, even if you need the money, are there times when you need the money? Some of you just starting out. Some of you may have been around for a while. Sometimes you need the money. But you can't let profit get in the way of what doing what's right for the customer. Second thing, give customers a good, fair deal. Give customers a good, fair deal. So here's what I wrote down underneath that point. 
I learned this from Mike Ferry. You know, it's funny. We think about Mike Ferry. Would anyone who's ever been around Mike Ferry for 10 seconds, would you agree that he likes money? <laughs> See, Jack, sure, yeah. See Jack smiling. Yes, he likes money. Mike Ferry likes money. But here was one of the very interesting things that I learned from Mike Ferry, okay? If you negotiate a deal that's a win for the seller, but not a win for the buyer, it's not a good deal. Or vice versa. If you negotiate a deal that's good for the buyer and not for the seller, it's not a good deal. A good deal is when it's a win for the buyer and a win for the seller. Now, a win could be in a variety of different things. Oh, I got my seller the best price possible. How was that possibly a good deal for the buyer? Well, the buyer is competing against 15 offers. They got the house. They got the interest rate they wanted, the neighborhood they wanted. It worked out. They paid a lot for it, but they, they won. They got the house. Okay. Well, my seller had to do a $60,000 price reduction. How's that benefit for them? Seems like a win for the buyer. Well, did they get fair market value for the house? The seller? Yeah, then it's a win for them. They sold the house at fair market value and they're going to take the money and do what they need to do with it. But you have to give customers a good, fair deal. It has to be a win on both sides for the buyer and the seller. So make sure you keep that in mind when you're negotiating. Am I giving a good, fair deal to both sides when I do a counter offer? I feel like a lot of people don't do that. They feel like it's a fight. I'm trying to screw the buyer. No. I'm trying to screw the seller. I'm going to offer really low. Don't do that. It's got to be fair for everybody. Not only does that make it better for both sides, it shortens the amount of time between the transaction. Give you an example. Seller lists a property for $1 million. And you know that it's worth $1 million. You could go right in and say $1 million. Or you could do this. All right, we'll do 900,000. Okay, so you write up an offer 900,000. Two days later, the seller comes back and says 950. Okay, you come back, you go, to the, you go to the buyer. Two more days later, the buyer says 925. Okay, great. Then you go back to the seller. And then two days later, they say 925, uh, waive the appraisal contingency. And then you just go back and it takes time. Or I could do a clear, fair deal. They want 1 million, it's worth 1 million, done. Good, fair deal for everybody. Now, I wrote down here, this is where some of you are going to get mad at me. In order to give someone a good, fair deal, you have to do all the things you're going to say you're going to do. Because let's be honest, truth. Do most real estate agents give a good, fair deal based on the amount of commission they're charging? No, they do, do the least amount possible. Okay. Anyone else? Does anybody disagree with that? Do you think most real estate agents give a good, fair deal based on the amount of commission they're making per deal? I tend to agree with Reba. Most real estate agents don't give a good, fair deal based on the amount of commission they're getting versus the amount of work they're going to do. Now, some people do. Some people will do an 18-point action plan, a 25-point, a 30-point action plan, and they'll do all those steps, and they can charge 2.5%, 3%, whatever the case may be. Some of you, not maybe not here, most agents don't. They charge 2.5%, put it on the MLS, and then they're done. That's not a good fair deal. Do what you say you're going to do. All right, number three, great customer relationships take time. Do not try to maximize short-term profits at the expense of building those enduring relationships. Okay, great customer relationships take time. Do not try to maximize short-term profits at the expense of building those enduring relationships. You will get caught by your clients long-term if you don't look out for their best interests. You got the deal today, but you lost the future deals. Great relationships take time. Build a relationship. 
Number four, always look for ways to make it easier to do business with you. Always look for ways to make it easier to do business with you. Brady Sandall talked about this on Thursday. How easy is it for people to connect with you? Do they have to look you up? Do they have to Google you? Or can they just look up an email and have your email address, your phone number, things along those lines? Will you respond to text messages? Do you have a website? Can I find you? Make it easier for people to do business with you. One of which is they have to be able to find you. It's amazing as a recruiter how difficult it is to find some people. I'll get emails from agents going, hey, I'm curious to learn a little bit about your company. And the email will just have their name, no phone number. You Google them, there's no website, there's nothing. It's like, I, I'm finding, where's Waldo? How easy is it to do business with you? If somebody needs to connect with you, if somebody needs to schedule a showing, how fast can you get back to them? Somebody has a question about their home. How quickly can you get back to them? Make it easier. Respond via text message, automatic emails, notifications. Let me tell you an example. Let me give you an example about that. Jack Ma makes it very easy for people to work with him. Because when you get a list, when Jack takes a listing, he has systems automatically set up to where you're getting this email, you're getting this message, you're getting this, you're getting that, you're getting this. He makes it very easy. When you're on his database, because I get his emails, database, he makes it very easy. Hey, here's a link that connects you to the website. If you want a property value, here's a link that connects you to that. He makes it very easy to work with him. He's very easy to find. I'm sure that has nothing to do why this is the most production he's ever done in his entire career. It's just a coincidence. Make it easy for people to find you. Yes. Ruth. I have one thing that I thought was really cool that I could add to that is that when you have your emails, when you have your signature at the bottom, you have those links set up at the bottom of your emails, for instance, that are live so that when they go on their phone, let's say they read their email, they can tap it. It takes them straight to your Facebook or it takes them straight to your Instagram or to your website or your app, right. whatever it is that you have. And then, yeah, when you text them, if you spell out your phone number, your email, they can touch it and go to it. Yep. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. You should have that on all your stuff. Jocelyn's gone over classes on how to do that stuff as well. But always make it easier for people to do business with you. It's huge. Okay. Now, I also wrote down here, that means you might have to adjust with the times. There are a lot of people that are okay with face-to-face -face communication, but there's some people that still aren't comfortable with it. So can you do a good Zoom meeting? Can you do a good phone call meeting? Can you do 3D walkthroughs of properties? Sometimes that's part of making it easier to do business with you. Look at the banking world. The banking world adjusted, talking about JP Morgan Chase. You can do everything online, ATMs. Make it easier for people to do business with you. All right, a couple more points here. Wrote down, communicate daily with your customers. Here's the line, okay? Here's the line. This is from JP Morgan Chase. Tell me that this doesn't resonate in real estate. Here's the line. If they are talking to you, they can't be talking to your competitor. That's in banking. Tell me that's not a great real estate line. <laughs> I mean, communicate daily with your customers. If they are talking to you, they can't be talking to a competitor. Huge. Now in real estate, boy, is it hard to find another real estate agent? No? Let's be honest. Does everybody in your database all know another real estate agent other than you? Oh, heck yeah. 100%. 100%. Probably five. Probably five. Well, they know two, and then the other three, they don't know that they have a real estate license, but they do. So they know another one. You have to communicate with your customers. If they're talking to you, they can't be talking to a competitor. Now, I wrote down here from a banking standpoint, what a bank does is they 
contact you regarding every different asset. They might contact you regarding a checking account, a savings account. Then they might contact you regarding an IRA. What about a private banking account? What about an investment account? They have a lot of different things they can contact you about. Well, so do you as a real estate agent. I can tell you about a recent sale, a recent listing, some stats, my listing, my sale. I can tell you about all these different things going on, how to upgrade curb appeal, what's going on with interest rates. You have a lot of different things you can communicate with your customers about the same way a bank does. If they're talking to you, they can't be talking to a competitor. And then they wrote down here the value system. We're almost done. Don't forget to say thank you. Don't forget to say thank you. I think I asked this question before. Does anybody, let's take a guess. You can either put it in the chat box or unmute yourself. What's the most profitable fast food chain in the United States? Anybody want to take a guess at that? Most profitable fast food chain in the United States? McDonald's. Tess says McDonald's. Anyone else? Not saying you're wrong. Just anyone else want to take a guess? Chick-fil-A. Chick Yvonne says Chick-fil-A. Anyone else? In and out. In and out. I say McDonald's too. McDonald's. Okay. The most profitable fast food chain in the United States is, as Yvonne said, Chick-fil-A. It's the most profitable one, which is fascinating nice because they're only open six days a week. Okay. Everyone else is open 24 hours, seven days, stuff like that. Now they're probably the most profitable for a number of other reasons, but I'm sure it's no coincidence that in a study they do every year, Chick-fil-A also wins the, in terms of fast food restaurants the most likely to say please and thank you. They do this study. I don't know how they do the damn study. I'm not gonna get into the details of it, but they do a study every year, the fast food franchises, which fast food franchise is most likely to say please and thank you based on customer responses and Chick-fil-A is number one. I'm sure there is no coincidence as to that they're also the most profitable fast food franchise. Don't forget to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're blowing my mind. I know, isn't it? Thank you, thank you, thank you. They give you a referral. Oh, thank you. Don't say, I can't wait to call them. All right, see you later. Now you could say, I can't wait to call them, but say, thank you, okay? And then when you call them and you call, you call them back and say, hey, I just spoke to John. We're meeting Tuesday. Thank you again. Greatly appreciate it. And then you list John's property. You call, I just listed John's property. Thank you again. And then you close John's property. We just closed. Thank you again. Thank you. 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 All right. That's the base core values of JP Morgan Chase. Now, I'm going to run through this last part here, okay, because we're right up on time. Because they also say that they also strive to be the most efficient with great operations, okay? Now, here's the last points of their value system, okay? These are a list of behaviors that tie into their value system, okay? And I'll, I'll, put, this in, I'll put these in the chat box after I'm done reading them because so, I'm going to go pretty fast, all right? There's eight of them. One, leaner is better. Leaner is better. What that means is cut out anything that's not making money. To do that, you have to run a profit and loss statement. Cut out anything that's not making funny. Also, understand that you're not going to be a fit for everybody. We hear this all the time from top agents, Mike Ferry, so and so forth, is that you have to purge your database because sometimes you might have 1,600, 2,000 people in your database. That's too many for most people. If you're Lucy Ham, who's been in business for 45 years, that's a different story. Okay. All right. Number two, they wrote down here is eliminate bureaucracy. Okay. 
So important, now the definition of a bureaucracy is where important decisions are made by state officials rather than elected representatives. Now in a bank, a large, that's a different story, but for yourself, you have to decide who's making the decisions for your business. Is it you? Is it your assistants? Is it, you know, CRA or CRA, CAR, NAR? Who's making the decisions for your business? Let me give you an example, okay? Because there's not many examples of that. Well, so many people call expireds. So they're making the decision for you to call expireds, even though you're not making any money off of it. That would be eliminate bureaucracy. You make the decisions on what's best for you. Number three, cut waste relentlessly. Kind of goes back to leaner is better. Number four, operations should be fast and simple. Okay, fast and simple. Number five, value each other's time. That's a biggie in our business. You ever feel like the other real estate agent is not valuing your time? You ever feel like lenders don't value your time? Title reps, ESCO officers, HOAs. <laughs> <laughs> HOAs, right? Don't be like them, teach them. Value each other's time. And if you're not going to value their time, then just get rid of them from your phone book. All right, number six, invest in infrastructure. So in our business could be Invest in a good computer, a good phone. Invest in, if you're going to be calling a lot, a dialer, phone numbers, a CRM. Invest in infrastructure. Number seven, we should know our business best. Ooh, boy. How many times have we talked about that? If a client knows about a property or a sale or something before you do, no bueno. That's why I don't like setting buyers up on automatic emails. You set them up on an automatic email, that means they might know about a new listing before you do. I don't like that. That's just me. And number eight, we don't need consultants to tell us what to do. We know our business best. We know what's best for us. We don't need that. That kind of goes a little bit into the bureaucracy thing, okay? I just pasted that in the chat box. But that's how they, that's how they do this. They're the most profitable company. They're 20% more profitable than the company that's number two. And they have a defined rule. Does everyone see how all these values can make a company profitable? Yes. The, and, and do you see how these values can be used in real estate? Okay, great. I do. So let's just go with that for now. We're listening, but I'm writing. <laughs> okay. writing. All right. Good, good, good. Questions on anything I went over? All right. Very good. So the homework is for those of you that haven't defined any values for your system, define your values. And for those of you that do have defined values, review them, make sure they still stick because sometimes values can change, okay? They're not a definite ending. They could change. Make sure they still stick. Make sure that you're following them and maybe you need to add more or delete some, okay? But make sure you have a set, a set design values for your business. All right, everybody. That's all I got. Thank you so much.